Now, although your flights were delightfully short, albeit perhaps uh, as a result your remuneration wasn't quite as high as it could have been, were there any efforts to monitor your uh, radiation levels when you were flying Concorde? Yes, they were very concerned about that, the really? regulators, yeah, yeah. And that's what led to the fitting of a radiation meter. Oh, you had and one on board? We had one on board. Mm -hmm. And it was colour-coded, green zone, amber zone, and a red zone. And if it ever went into the red zone, there was a drill for it. And that was basically to descend below 48,000 feet into, into thicker air. Wow. Which would have incurred a massive fuel penalty doing mm. that, by the way. And as far as I'm aware, I'm absolutely certain it never happened on a British Airways flight, and I'm pretty sure it never happened on an Air France flight that they ever had a radiation alert. Having said that, I was coming into Heathrow one day, and we were at 6,000 feet just south of Aldermaston, and suddenly there's this bong and a red light and the radiation alert. I think it was a leaky day at Aldermaston. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think people living <laughs> near Aldermaston would have loved it. No, no. But it's interesting, uh, considering all the Met forecasts and things that we consider, did you actually get forecasts of solar flares and that sort of thing that might have raised the level of uh, radiation? No, we didn't. Okay. No. I was just curious. Brilliant. Now, it, personal question from me here, really. Taxing out in Concord, you always seem to have priority over the other traffic that was on the ground to save fuel. How did you can feel about continually queue jumping? I think that's a bit of a distortion, Nick. Are you sure? At, 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 Heath, <laughs> at Heathrow, there were very they have wonderful air traffic controllers at Heathrow, but they're British, you know, and you don't go queue jumping. And we used to just wait in the queue for really? the taxi. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Honestly, cross my heart. <laughs> okay, I'll take you with. I'll, How about I'll, New I'll, York? I'll tell you a different story about New York. Yes, there. well, uh, <laughs> I say I spent a while in the queue at New York, the, that's the for New sure. The New York controllers had no such compunctions. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a holding pattern at 25,000 feet or something in this Concorde, and you can't be in a holding pattern in the Concorde. I mean, you're burning as much fuel per hour in a holding pattern as you were when you were flying at Mach 2. Oh, good Lord. And, get, and getting absolutely nowhere. Mm. Um, and so you can do maybe one turn and then you say, we're diverting. And I just said to the co-pilot, please request a diversion to Windsor Locks, which is about 60 miles northeast of Kennedy Airport. And he put in this request and Kennedy Airport came back quick as a flash. They said, OK, turn right, do this gave us several different frequency changes. We ended up on a discrete frequency, just us and New York. And they said, you're cleared now to turn left, establish on ILS 22 left approach Kennedy Airport. Oh, we, I love it. We never requested that. Wouldn't have dreamt of requesting it. They had queue jumped us. <laughs> The EQ jumped us. Well, now I know about it, I'm going to resent it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, uh, I know I, in the Air Force, occasionally dropped a supersonic boom over land. Uh, did you ever do it in Concord? Yes, we did. Um, we had a route to Bahrain, and that route was subsonic from Heathrow across Europe to Venice. We'd get out into the Adriatic and then accelerate up to Mach 2. Down the Adriatic, heading in a sort of southeasterly direction, then turning left and going south of, um, where would we be going south of? Greece and Cyprus and all this lot, and heading east now and going straight over the Lebanon and Syria and Iraq supersonic all the way to Bahrain. <laughs> was that because you 
uh, didn't expect anyone in Lebanon <laughs> to complain. <laughs> I don't know how that was negotiated. <laughs> Not, nothing to do with me, Garth. <laughs> I, love it. Um, I guess in a way, they had so many bombs and things going off in Lebanon because this was all, you know, this is these are areas at war and a, the odd sonic boom. What the hell was that, you know? <laughs> now, on climbing into Concord, this is off another interview, you once said of it, none of this poncy glass cockpit. Do you have strong feelings nah. about modern cockpit design? No, no, no. <laughs> Not really. I just, I just love saying it because I like dials and needles and things like that because that's what I've been used to all my life. No, I was just going to make the point that at the time it was probably one of the most advanced cockpits that were flying around. Yep, yep, yep. Excellent. Now, here's one that might create a little bit of uh, a discussion. After the Air France Concorde crash, yep. the operating captain seemed to have made a number <coughs> of critical errors, such as taking too much fuel, um, bags, additional bags that led him uh, to be departing overweight, uh, then accepted a tailwind. Um, what was it about the culture on that flight deck that prevented his crew from intervening? Was it something to do with the prestigious position he was in as being uh, the captain of an aircraft like Concorde? Oh dear. I, I, th I think for a start, the Air France Concorde fleet had a slightly gung-ho culture anyway. And that is actually recorded in the, in the French accident report into that crash. There is somewhere in that accident report, I've got a copy of it upstairs, an English version of it. And it does criticize this rather press-on attitude of the of the Air France Concorde fleet. Um, so I think there was a sort of endemic culture that existed within Air France about the operation of the aeroplane. Um, as far as that particular flight was concerned, I know that that captain was considered as an absolutely ace pilot. He'd windsurfed across the Atlantic. He was a fantastic skier. He was very charismatic. And my own reading of it is that the first officer and the flight engineer on that flight had almost got the attitude, well, if Christian Marty thinks it's okay to go, then you know, who am I to question him? I don't think he was overbearing. I mean, I've, I've looked through the cockpit um, voice recorder traces and there's nothing overbearing about it. There's, um, you know, there's nobody, act the fact of the matter is nobody questions anything. It's just, you know, if, if the captain's happy with it, I'm happy with it. We won't question it. Um, I'm in a bit of trouble with, with, with talking about this, by the way, because um, Pilot Magazine, the current issue, has just published an article by a chap called Pat Malone. I don't know who Pat Malone is, and he is very critical of me. And he ends this article by saying that the Air France flight crew were blameless, and I have no business to be criticizing them. I don't enjoy criticizing them at all. I'm sure it's, you're doing, it only gives doing me, what the, your interpretation of what the extra report says. It gives me no pleasure at all, um, absolutely none. But how on earth Mr. Malone thinks that those flight crew members were blameless is beyond me. The airplane was over the maximum structural takeoff weight over the maximum structural takeoff weight. It was beyond the aft limits of center of gravity. It accepted a clearance with 
a tailwind, an eight knot tailwind. That effectively put it at something like six and a half to seven tons over the weight it should have been at. Mm. It embarked on this takeoff with the captain, I assume, well aware of the fact that his COG was beyond the aft limits. So the transfer valve and the booster pumps were on, transferring fuel along the length of the aeroplane from tank 11 in the tail cone up into the wing tanks. So fuel was being pumped up the length of the aeroplane throughout that takeoff run, effectively filling up those already full tanks and keeping them full. Um, that was completely contrary to correct procedures. That fuel transfer business is not supposed to take place during the takeoff at all. That's supposed, the shut-off valve's supposed to be shut and the booster pump's off. Um, so, you know, you look at all these these things and, and de depressingly, really depressingly, nobody on that flight deck is questioning that captain. The co-pilot never puts his hand up and says, hey, hang on a minute, skipper. We've got a tailwind. I think we've got to recalculate our speeds and all the rest of it. No question of sort of saying, well, why not go down to the other end of the runway and take off in the opposite direction? I mean, it really was a crash that never should have happened. It's deeply depressing. And in the accident report, they blame two things. They blame a piece of metal on the runway, which was indeed one of the errors in the error chain, but only one of a whole series of errors in the error chain. And on design weaknesses in the aeroplane. It was nothing to do with design weaknesses in the aeroplane. To me, Concorde was about the safest aeroplane I've ever flown because it, it was built like a proverbial brick lavatory. I mean, I'm serious now. I mean, it looks beautiful and elegant. It was as tough as old boots. Um, I mean, they'd, the manufacturers had memories of the Comet blowing up, three Comet airliners that blew up through explosive decompressions, and they were quite neurotic and about the same sort of thing happening with the Concorde. So it was really over-engineered. Very, very strong aeroplane. I, I don't know. I've, 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 I shall respond to this article in due course when I um, when I get get around to it. But um, but how on earth it can be said that the flight crew are blameless is completely beyond mm. my comprehension. Yeah. I'm sorry, they were to blame. And uh, you know I've spoken at length to two Air France Concorde pilots who would both totally endorse my views about this without I, I any think, question. I think you're best placed to uh, give a, a, an accurate opinion on that. Um, how would you uh, best describe BA's decision to ground Concorde after all the modifications following the Air France crash have been done? Well, I think British Airways basically had no choice. Air France did not want to go on flying it. They never wanted to go on flying it after that crash. I don't know, uh, you, you probably, I, I didn't even know if it's in the book, but that Concorde that day came within 20 feet of hitting a 747 that was parked mm -hmm. by the left-hand side of the runway on a taxiway. Yes, you, you mentioned that. And that airplane had on board President Sherek and his wife. They'd mm. come in from a state visit to Tokyo, to, to Japan, and flown in from Tokyo. So that day, Air France came within 20 feet of one of their Concords hitting one of their 747s with the President of France on board. It doesn't bear thinking about it, does it? No, it does not. But having said so, that, BA had still a very successful operation with the aircraft. Yep. Yes. And they spent all that money modifying <coughs> it. Yeah, but the trouble is that Air France didn't want to go on with it. And in, 19, in 2003, with that Iraq War II happening and passenger loads decreasing and suddenly Air France finding itself 
flying with half a dozen Concorde passengers. Um, they were hemorrhaging and they never wanted to go on with it anyway. Mm. They would have been very happy to have grounded it immediately after that crash and never to have it flying ever again. And it was only because they were locked into this agreement with British Airways that um, all these modifications, which were fine, you know, I've got no problems with the modifications that were done, but to try and sort of suggest that that was a solution to prevent such a crash ever happening again was absolute nonsense. So when, as I say, the Iraq War II happened, they went along to see Airbus and just said, look, we can't go on like this. Um, what are we going to do? And Airbus just simply said, we'll hike up the product support costs of, of the aeroplane to a level British Airways can't afford. Now, I suppose British Airways could have challenged Airbus's decision in court, but the fact of the matter was, it was quite clear that Air France did not want to go on operating the aeroplane, and we're not going to go on operating the aeroplane. And British Airways would find it very difficult to do so on their own. So um, basically, it, I think British Airways were left with no choice but to, but to endorse the decision to ground the aeroplane, yeah. which I think was tragic. Yeah. Uh, it should have been allowed to retire honorably and gracefully, not sort of press ganged into retirement. So having retired and left your fast, sleek, droopy-nosed mistress behind, I'm glad that you found plenty to do, but a bit concerned at the number of life-threatening accidents you seem to have had. Do you have an explanation? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, I've, tr I've tried many, many times to, to dispose of myself and failed on each attempt. So there we are. Fate is... Fate has obviously singled me out as somebody who's singled out to survive. <laughs> That's very good. Yeah. Now, I visited Concord at the Intrepid uh, Museum in New York. Yep. I would describe it as little more than an awning for the cafe. Who do you think's done the best job of displaying the retired Concords? Ah, that's a very good question. I would have said Barbados. Uh, but sadly, the Barbados one's closed at, uh, at the moment. And oh. it's, it, they just haven't got the funding. Yeah. So they've got this wonderful hurricane-proof hangar that it lives in right alongside the airport. Mm. And it's all closed up, which is a tragedy because those team of people in Barbados who were looking after it were so proud of it. Mm. And it was, of all the Concords, that was probably the best kept and best looked after. Wow. It was very, very well presented. Having said that, Barbados is closed. Um, the one at Bristol, at Filton, that's uh, at whatever they call it, Bristol um, Aerospace Museum or whatever its official title is, that is very well presented. I've been to see that. The one in Manchester is very well presented. Mm, I've been up there too, yes. Um, I haven't been to the one in Edinburgh. There's one up there. I must go up there sometime and have a look at that. Um, probably the best museum for the sort of overall Concord experience is probably Brooklyn's. Because oh. they've got there a Concord that never actually flew with British Airways. It was the it was a pre-production model, which was cut up and taken by road to Brooklands and then rebuilt by people at Surrey University. Wow. As part of their sort of university course. Oh, as what a great were. idea. And there it stands in Brooklands with all its seats and things in it and, and sort of projections of what a typical supersonic flight looked like. And Excellent. It's very well done. And furthermore, and for anybody who watches this, please go to Brooklands and go and fly the simulator. Because that's the simulator that I used to fly in my training at Filton. The simulator was removed from Filton, taken to Brooklands, 
and the idea was going to be that it would just be there as an object that pe people could sort of walk on to and look at the simulator. This is the way they did their training. Not a bit of it. A team of geeks from British Airways, from the electronic sort of side of things, and, um, and, and other the hydraulics and all the rest of it got together and they got that simulator working. They fitted to it a better visual system than I ever had <laughs> when I was flying it. I love it. It was a wonder. It's a wonderful visual system and you can buy yourself a sort of half hour Concorde flying experience and go flying under the uh, Brooklyn Bridge or whatever else you want to do. Supersonic? <laughs> You're probably why, why, not quite supersonic, I think. I don't think our, our flight envelope allowed for that. <laughs> Excellent. But it, it, it's really good fun. It's a, it's a wonderful museum and well worth visiting. Wow, thanks. Um, also, there's a Concorde on display in Seattle, at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. And I'm very proud of the one there because it attracts more people going on board than the presidential 747 sitting next door to it. That's, that's, what, that's the museum at Boeing Field, is it? Yeah, yeah. Lovely, yep. lovely to have a Concorde at the heart of Boeing. It's lovely to have a Concorde <laughs> in the heart of Boeing. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Now, looking back on your long and illustrious career, John, what do you tend to think of as your greatest achievement? Oh gosh, I, th I, th I think it has to be having the luck to be in the right place at the right time to get on to Concord. I mean, Concord has meant so much to me and has been so much an integral part of my life. Um, I mean, I was, I'm married to Sue, but I was also married to Concord. Your droopy nose she mistress. Was, she was a very beautiful droopy nose mistress. <laughs> I love it. Needle nose mistress as well. Oh, right. Okay, Might well. have a droopy nose, but it was, <laughs> it was a pretty sharp pointed nose.